isn't a client that I've met that at one time or another, I haven't suggested blueberry gemotherapy extract. The shoots of this extract are so powerful that it's very hard to believe that it comes from such a tiny little plant. I'm Lauren Hubele. I'm an expert in gemotherapy and a health coach. And I'm here to welcome my co-host, herbalist Terry Brooks. Good morning, Lauren and Megan and everyone else watching. Pleased to be with you today. Delighted to have you, Terry. And acupuncturist Megan Lemp. Hi, Lauren and Terry. It's great to be with you. My name is Megan Lamp, and I practice acupuncture and gemotherapy. And with the two of these amazing ladies, we're going to take a tour through the European blueberry plant, what it does as an extract, and how it looks through the lens of Asian medicine. So Terry, we're going to start with you. What can you tell us about European blueberry as a shrub? I love this plant. I can say that this, the American low bush version is probably the first thing I ever foraged when I was maybe four or five with my mom, my aunts, and my grandparents, and many years out in the woods picking these. This plant is known as Vaccinium myrtillus, and as you said, it's called Euro European blueberry, um, also called bilberry, hortleberry, huckleberry, whimberry. <laughs> um, one thing I read was that those people, when you, when you get out in the woods and you're just stuffing this berry foot into your mouth, they call that muckle mouth. <laughs> I, I was a muckle mouth kid for many years. Um, this is a perennial sub shrub that grows in coniferous or birch forests in Northern Europe in well-drained but yet moist soil. It's again related to the high bush and wild low bush blueberry. Uh, the blooms are small, they're white or pinkish white, with a little bell-shaped blossom to them, and they grow in clusters of eight to ten, usually blooming between April and June. Uh, berries will turn, or the berries will come on uh, later on, July to September. I always figured end of July, September, or August was when I was picking them in Minnesota. The leaves are small and oval, kind of leathery feeling, very small though. It's interesting that there's a different color on the top than on the bottom of the leaf. The top being a kind of dark green and the bottom almost having a white to it. And the berries also, the blue black berries have what's called a bloom on them. That little whitish sheen on it that you can rub off with your hand. Did I cover everything? <laughs> I think you did and more. You know, I'm glad to say that you, they do grow in North America. I'm only familiar uh, in finding them in Europe and coming uh, from Texas, we certainly don't see them here. So that's exciting. Um, in all your research and looking into this, has there been some folklore or historical uses you have uncovered? Well, I found it interesting that there's a myth from Greek and Roman uh, mythology that bilberries were created by Hermes his Roman name is Mercury. And this was when he turned his son's body into his son's name, Myrtillus. So we get the species in the, there. Um, turned him into a, a berry shrub when his body washed on the shore. And to make this a short story, it was a long one that involved cheating in a chariot race. And the one person's chariot overturned. And on his deathbed, he was asking for revenge. And this was all to win a maiden's hand in marriage, of course. And Myrtillus was the cheater. His body was thrown into the sea and he was drowned. So it's named after him. That was one little legend. Um, and, and of course, in some parts of the world, the berries are grown along the seashore. Most often I find them in the woods though. There, um, in, in Ireland, these berries were celebrated with a sort of a holiday called Frunasa, and that was from Sunday. These were named after the berries, and the people would all go out and, and celebrate by climbing the hills and pick the blueberries and bake them into cakes and bring them down into town, and all the girls were trying to bake the most wonderful cake to give to their fella or fellow that they were interested in. Um, this, this kind of tied in with all the Celtic calendar stuff and you know when the berries were ripe, of course. 
Native Americans have also depended on these berries for a food source and often mixed it with ground meat to dry into something called pemmican. Some seeds and things like that were often used also, roots perhaps, and then stored as a winter food when there was little or no fresh food available, they had pemmican to eat. During World War II, I thought this was interesting. British pilots used bilberry jam to help restore their eyesight, especially night vision. Mm -hmm. Wow, interesting. Well, are there some specific indications that the, when you look at the plant or, or study it of its medicinal qualities? Well, usually when we look at a plant that has such a dark purple color, we know that that involves anthocyanins. And anthocyanins are known to stabilize DNA, to improve insulin secretion, and to reduce cardiovascular disease. It also contains glutathione, which improves circulation, re sometimes reduces symptoms of Parkinson's. Hyaluronic acid, and there's a great another word for this if you can get your tongue around it, mucopolysaccharides. <laughs> and that's a long chain of sugar molecules that protects and strengthens the mucous membranes anywhere in the body, as well as the skin, supplies fluids to the joints, bathes the eyes with fluid, and strengthens blood vessels, so it improves the circulation. Throughout history, the leaves were used just as often as the fruit. And they say it's a tasty tea. I can't say I haven't tried the actual bilberry tea, um, but it lowered blood sugar. It tightened the urinary tract, toning and astringing tissues everywhere. It's used, it's mentioned in many old texts from Russia, Europe, and China as an herb that's been valuable for the ability to aid healing from many diseases of the digestive system, the circulatory system, and the eyes. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you, Terry. That was very interesting. So let's take a look at what happens when we take that bilberry or European blueberry plant and use the shoots and turn that into a gemotherapy mm -hmm. extract. We're going to see that the primary action of that is, on the, is as a tonic for the intestines. It regulates the motility of stool and it improves flora. In, in its action, it also resolves inflammation in the blood vessels in the intestines, making it especially important when addressing dysbiosis. This term dysbiosis has been very overused in our vocabulary these days, and, and it refers to some, some uh, leakage in the intestines. And, there are, are very complex protocols offered in the different worlds of natural medicine for this. And I want to say, I find um, European blueberry to be a very simple and precise extract that over time really does the work that we want in resolving that. And more importantly, in its work with the prevention of E. coli bacteria, from adhering to the mucosal lining of the intestines and the urinary tract. This is very important in what we call gut health today. And I think these actions are what make it one of those extracts that we can tend to go back to as we're working with a client or working on our own health. We take a little break from it, work on some other areas, and then come back and revisit it. There are two secondary actions of European blueberry gemotherapy extract. And the first is on microcirculation in the head, strengthening the vein walls in both the eyes and the ears, and as a mild diuretic on the kidneys. Indirectly, these actions of blueberry extract actually improve menstrual symptoms in women that either have heavy cramping, heavy bleeding, and this comes through the optimization of elimination, both through stool and urine. So who might consider European blueberry? And there are many, many variations of the individual who could benefit from this extract, as you can imagine. So I see this really um, applicable to all ages, male or female. Individuals, particularly with an inflammatory systems in the urinary tract or intestines, or a history of them, a history or current ear or eye inflammation, and then any woman with um, a history of or current menstrual 
in irregularities. Now, in the acute use for blueberry, it's particularly recommended in protocols for the ears and the eyes. So it's an excellent one for ear inflammation, um, particularly those that, that plagues little ones, and it's used in combination with other extracts such as dog rose and black currant. In, um, um, as in, in microdoses, there's no current information on that. However, when we're working with someone on their elimination, we know that it improves consistency and motility for anyone with stool types one through four and can be used in lower doses for those with Bristol stool type 4.5 to 5. Um, it's an extract for those with medium to high vitality. So in low vitality cases, other extracts would be used first to bring that um, vitality up. And then when we're working long term with someone and we're trying to resolve chronic symptoms, these are the symptoms that we would look to blueberry for. Infections of the intestines or urinary tract, eye symptoms to include the loss of pigmentation from the retina and macular degeneration. Anyone with ocular headaches, infants and children born C-section who didn't receive the, um, the uh, correct populations of bacteria from their mother, this can be very useful early on for infants and children with chronic ear infections. For adults with chronic ear blockages, it's very good with the extract rowan and lithy, which we'll talk about in other episodes. And then for women with heavy menstrual flow or cramping, along with black currant. So that's quite a bit it has to offer um, from the gemotherapeutic lens. Megan, why don't you share what you see from the Asian medicine lens? I am just, this is such an important extract and I am just pausing and thinking about everything that Terry, Lauren, and you just shared and how widespread and applicable this extract really is. There isn't, there's hardly a, a system in the body that we haven't named yet. Right. So blueberry from an Asian medical lens is a cleaning, harmonizing, and tonic. It facilitates the movement of chi. So when we just talk about our fundamental movement in the body, blueberry facilitates the movement of chi. And therefore, it's facilitating the movement of blood and of fluids and of waste through the system. It's keeping pathogens from proliferating and aiding in the body's ability to clean itself more effectively. Let's look at the relationship with the gut biome. That's something, Lauren, that you referenced, and again, is sort of a hot topic right now when we talk about digestion and immunity. And let's talk about the balancing of flora. And the reason why I think everybody is so interested in talking about that is because the gut biome is linked not just to our healthy digestion, but to our mood and to our protection against pathogens and disease prevention, our immune system. Although we think about this through a very different lens when we're looking at Asian medicine, what we call our spleen chi, our lung chi, and our kidney chi together provide those very same functions. And that's how blueberry acts in the system. Dysbiosis and bacteria adhering to mucosal linings are a product of blood and fluids in the body stagnating. Problems arise when chi and blood and fluids congeal and they thicken and they become stagnant or lodged and we start to see things slow down and become obstructed. Chi in its very nature has the nature of movement. So when blood and body fluids and chi are moving smoothly, the body can effectively clean itself and it's just not a friendly environment for bacteria proliferation. So in this, concept, in this context, health requires both the abundance of chi and to keep it moving. So if we review, how is chi made? We know that we're born with our ancestral chi that's stored in the kidneys, and that's what we inherit from our ancestors. This is our original source of chi. But the chi that we're constantly producing and refreshing and making on a daily basis is the product of our digestive system. And that is controlled with what we call the spleen and stomach energy. 
what we call spleen in Chinese and Japanese medicine is not the same as the meaning in allopathic medicine. From an Asian medical lens, spleen is the partner of stomach, and together they make up our main digestive organs. And spleen role, spleen's role is to extract nutrients from the food and fluid that we take in and to carry it up to the lungs. So qi derives nutrients from food and fluids, it raises it up to the lungs, and it sends waste down to the small intestine. And I think that this is important because when spleen's qi is compromised, it not only impairs digestion and absorption of food and fluids, but it also depletes the necessary ability to maintain the integrity of the small intestine. And if we go back to Blueberry's role in addressing dysbiosis, we know that that often has some small intestine involvement. And the initial damage to the integrity of the small intestine is due to damage of the spleen chi energy. So spleen chi rises and stomach chi descends. Uh, spleen chi's nature is to ascend. After food and fluid are broken down, the nutrients are carried up to the lung to make chi and to the heart to make blood. Lung is important because it's the most exterior of our meridians in our body. And it not only makes the body's chi, but it spreads it out to the rest of the system and forms an outer layer of protection over our surface. It's where the interior and the exterior of the body meet and it acts as our first layer of defense against the environment. It's also our upper source of water. There's an old medical text that says, if the lung is our upper source of water and it loses its crucial descending function, we'll start to see symptoms of stuffy chest, coughing, signs of water stagnation such as phlegm, and maybe some edema set in. On the other hand, we have lung as our upper source of water and kidney as our lower source of water. Kidney cleans and filters all of the blood and body fluids in the system. And the relationship between lung and kidney is very much at play in upper respiratory challenges. Kidney roots and grounds our breath. When lung expands and contracts, kidney grounds that breath and gives us a nice deep breath. And we often see blueberry used in cases of chronic respiratory things, maybe some asthmatic type situations. If kidney is weak, the lung can't descend and we'll start to see symptoms of, again, fluid stagnation, um, not quite being able to root and ground and take a nice deep breath. And when spleen is able to extract nutrients, ascend food chi up to the lung, and both lung and kidney, our upper and lower sources of water are supported, chi and fluid in the body can move and the body can more effectively clean itself. Wow, wow. It does touch on just about everything, doesn't it? It's really amazing. You know, when I first began studying gemotherapy and I, I looked, I used blueberry a lot right early on because I had so much success with it. I always envisioned it as little scrub brushes going into the body. But as you described that, that's actually what it, it sounds like. Just they're dispersing in these different areas. Yes. It's sort of, you know, if we think about the chakra system or other ways of looking at the body, blueberry sort of gets all of them moving in unison with each other so that we can get what we need from things and leave the rest. Yeah. Blueberry yeah. was one of my, the first extracts that made a real pivotal difference in my health. Wow, that's good to hear, Megan. And what you said though was very important because we really don't want to get everything moving in people that have very low vitality. So giving time to bring that vitality up and finding the right time to bring blueberry into protocol is essential. I think we have touched on this before, Lauren, and I think it's beautiful just because if we start with a case with low vitality, or if you're listening and you have low vitality and this isn't the extract for you, Pause, because there will be a time in the future when this will suit you just beautifully. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. So if someone wants to find out more about Asian medicine, Megan, where would they go? Yes, there's a great book that's very readable called The Web That Has No Weaver. And if you'd like to find out more about my practice or general therapy through an Asian lens, you can visit my website, acculemp.com.
Beautiful. And Terry, more about trees. Where would they go? So many books about trees. I can always recommend Diana Beresford Kroger, although blueberry probably is not in here, though it, it's not really considered a tree. But uh, herbally, you might pick any book. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Terry. And if you're looking for more on gemotherapy, please um, don't hesitate to go to my website, Lauren com. You'll find uh, quite a bit of free information on my blog. You can take a look at the classes I offer or look into the books that I've written on gemotherapy. So thank you ladies so much for joining me today and for this enlightening discussion on blueberry. Thank you.